you've given us the background for vitamin D, but where does vitamin D fit with immunity and autoimmune disease? Yes, well, there are obviously two principal arms of the immune system. You have the innate immune system, which is a sort of rapid non-specific response to an infection or uh, some sort of damage to the tissue. And that would involve cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. And vitamin D can act on them. It very potently promotes antibacterial and antiviral responses in those cells. That's non-specific. The other arm of the immune system is the um, adaptive immune system, which is the more sustained and specific response that we see from T cells and B cells producing antibodies, for example. And here, vitamin D can, appears to act by acting on T cells to suppress the normal inflammatory responses that you would get to an infection. Of course, we need inflammations to create some sort of response to an infection. But if you have too much of a response from your adaptive immune system, you can then create this inflammatory environment that can damage tissues. And that can lead to conditions such as autoimmune disease, where you have an inappropriate inflammatory response to uh, something that the, the infection, the initial infection may have actually abated and disappeared but you're still getting this sustained inflammatory response, which can damage tissues. And that's where vitamin D has its sort of second function, which is to dampen down inappropriate inflammatory responses. And it does this by suppressing the T cells that are known to be associated with this. These are Th1, T helper uh, type one and T helper uh, 17 T cells. It dampens them down, but it also importantly, increases uh, expression of cells, which are known as regulatory T cells or T regs. And they act to sort of um, adapt the immune system and calm it down quite a bit. So it's promoting the good guys in inflammation and dampening down the bad guys. And in this way, vitamin D could be quite an important factor in terms of just generally keeping your inflammation down and prote potentially protecting against this inappropriate response that can lead to autoimmune disease. So does this mean there is a link between vitamin D deficiency? and autoimmune disease? It does suggest mechanistically that there, that there would be a link, that if your vitamin D levels, your 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels were low, it would mean that your macrophages, dendritic cells, and actually we know now that T cells themselves can also activate vitamin D. So all of those cells would have less 25 hydroxy vitamin D to work with and could make less active 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So if you're vitamin D deficient, theoretically, your adaptive immune system, your suppression of inflammation might be less. Now, to date, the evidence for that has really stemmed from what's known as association studies. Um, and that means that people have looked at the levels of vitamin D in people who have uh, healthy individuals and compared them to individuals who've got various autoimmune diseases, type one diabetes, Crohn's disease, um, multiple sclerosis and so on and said, yeah, it's what's interesting is that those individuals tend to have lower levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So that's some link between vitamin D deficiency in those diseases. Now, of course, uh, if you've been critical of that, you'd say it's um, an association and, then, and only an association. It's not necessarily evidence of causality. And that, of course, has been one of the major hurdles for the vitamin D field is to try and and show that this there is some causal effect of vitamin D in but, uh, vitamin D deficiency and potentially predisposing individuals towards uh, autoimmune diseases. But to date, that evidence, of course, is, is difficult to get because essentially what you have to have is uh, a randomized control trial in which people are receiving high levels of vitamin D to correct that vitamin D deficiency and then look to see whether they go on to develop autoimmune disease, which is not easy to do given that it can take many years to develop something like multiple sclerosis or type 1 diabetes. Mm. So the next logical question is what is a normal vitamin D level? That, that is the $64,000 question. What is normal? What should be the optimal level of vitamin D? Obviously you're measuring mainly 25 hydroxy vitamin D and if you're measuring 25 hydroxy vitamin D it's very difficult to say what would um, be normal. What we do know is that various organizations have looked at this. And the National Academy of Medicine in North America in 2010, they did a big study to try and determine what, what would be a normal level of vitamin D. And they based this exclusively around the effects of vitamin D on, on bone health, 
on protecting against rickets. And they recommended a level of um, 50 nanomoles per litre. So one other thing to point out is that you'll often find in the vitamin D world that different units are used. So some people will use nanomoles per litre and the, the optimal dose itself and recommended to reach is 50 nanomoles per litre, which is also 20 nanograms per milliliter, which is another way that vitamin D is often referred to as nanograms per milliliter. So that seems a, a reasonable thing uh, to do. Of course, the, one of the problems with that is that actually if you use that level as being anything above that is healthy or whatever, anything below that is unhealthy, then, then most people in the UK would be vitamin D deficient based on those parameters. So in the UK, for example, the Science Advisory Council on Nutrition said that uh, it would be very difficult for most people in the UK to reach that 50 nanomolar level. So um, we'll do something different, which is to say we'd rather you didn't go below another level, which is they took down to 25 nanomoles per litre, 10 nanograms per ml. And their idea here was simply don't go below that line and try and get above it. And so there, you can see there are already different approaches, different views of how vitamin D should be defined in terms of sufficiency and deficiency. And there are other people, um, certainly many clinicians in North America, for example, would say, well, look, neither of those two levels are really optimal. You should be aiming for an optimal level, which would be higher, 75 nanomoles per litre, for example. So we have this varying approach to what is considered to be normal for vitamin D. And I, I really, it's unclear what is the best approach to take. And certainly it's very difficult when you're carrying out randomized control supplementation trials, for example. To so give a good example of this would be many trials that are carried out in North America. They have, in general, their baseline levels of vitamin D are much higher than we have in the UK. So you'll often see that the baseline levels there may be as high as 75 nanomoles per liter in the general population. And then there's, supplementation studies are going higher than that. Whereas in the UK, if you did a similar trial, everybody would be lower. So there is a, a this is one of the areas of great con controversy in the vitamin D field is what level do we try to at attain? What is the optimal level we should be aiming for? And I think there are some interesting studies that have just come out recently, um, which have involved something called Mendelian randomization. Now, um, without going into too great a detail, what this is, is, is a way of saying that there are, as well as sunlight access and various foods, whatever, everybody has a genetic component to their vitamin D levels. And that's, you know, genetic variations in the enzymes that metabolize vitamin D, the proteins that carry it around and so on. And that genetic component, maybe a small component of the total vitamin D in your body, perhaps seven and a half percent for something like that. But of course, some people will always be predisposed to having slightly higher vitamin D than others. And if you use this tool on a wide range of people, hundreds of thousands of individuals, you can begin to see link that genetic uh, level of vitamin D to diseases and get some idea of the sort of level where you, you know, where you get better health effects. And what we see in there from those uh, those, those Mendelian randomization studies is that it seems very likely that 50 nanomolar 25 hydroxy vitamin D is a, is a threshold level for vitamin D. Really, we, I think we should be trying to get everybody above 50 nanomoles per liter. Whether you need to go higher, I think that's a, a matter for discussion, but certainly people less than 50 nanomoles per liter, they do appear to be more strongly linked with uh, disease risk than people who are over 50 nanomoles per litre. What's interesting is a couple of studies that come out in the last few months, which are, they use a slightly different approach. They use what's called non-linear approach. And it's, it's made a very good point, which I think that people tend to forget about when they're thinking about vitamin D, which is that having some vitamin D, being supplemented with vitamin D means much more to somebody who's deficient than it does to somebody who's already sufficient. If you're already at 75 nanomoles per liter, going up to 100, which is what some of the US trials have done, doesn't, doesn't give you a great advantage. But if you're down at 10 nanomoles per liter and you go up to 35, that's, that's a big improvement. And it's that idea that really that this is not a linear effect of vitamin D, but it's something which has a greater benefit to people who are, who are vitamin D deficient. And I think that's something we really need to get over is the idea that uh, the major beneficiaries of any vitamin D will be people who are deficient.
and there are plenty of them in the UK. Thank you.